Um, if this is your uh, first day here, um, I don't have time to explain Godzilla to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll be making gratuitous references to lizards which have grown out of control. Okay. Um, this this uh, troubling uh, passage uh, from the end of James uh, 5.13. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Um, well, I don't know. I, I live in West Texas. And apparently there is not a single righteous person in West Texas <laughs> or California, although it was raining a little bit today, isn't it? Uh, but I don't know about you, but my weather control prayers have been a little spotty. And that's just the beginning of it. Um, my ability to pray, pray people into better health, I'm not wildly successful at that. Um, in, in fact, there was kind of a joke at my church. We, we had one of our young people in a car wreck, and she was in a hospital a good ways away. We had to drive a couple hours to go see her, and we did. And she told her parents later that, that when the preacher visited me, I, assuming, I assumed I was dying. Um, and uh, that's a fair description of my record uh, and in that regard. Um, just the truth. Um, some of you have heard my story. I, um, just about every mistake you can make in ministry I've made. I, I went to visit one of our older members who was, who was dying uh, in the hospital and I and I got there, and he was sleeping so soundly I didn't want to rouse him, so I just prayed over him and left. And then I found out a few minutes later that um, he was dead. Uh, <laughs> and, and that he had been dead for just a little while. And so uh, uh, I also am very unsuccessful when I'm praying for the dead. Um, <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty spotty on all that. And uh, I would be a liar if I didn't tell you that the absolutism of this language bothers me. Now, part of the things you've probably seen in James this week is he's kind of that way about everything. You know, he's, he's kind of absolutist language. Uh, but you, ha you see that kind of same language in the Gospels in many places. Pray, this will happen. And um, I wonder about that, because you know people in James's church died, and he could still, he could still write that. Uh, so for a moment, I want to do my, uh, I want to I do the philosophy thing. That's the ground on which I am most comfortable. And for a few minutes, I'm going to do modal logic. And this is going to be deeply fascinating to you. <laughs> modal logic is the logic of possible worlds. Um, and it's, it's really sort of fascinating stuff. Let me, let me give you a sort of non-related example here. Um, 
a, a lot of people, when they, when they think about our world, think what I would like to have is a world very much like the world that we currently have, except I would not like there to be any pain or suffering in it. Uh, now, I won't take all the time that it would take to do this, but that is an utterly incoherent notion. It is possible to envision a world in which there is no pain or suffering, but that world has nothing in common with the world in which we live. Nor can it. I'll give you an easy example. If I have a brick in my hand and I drop the brick, it never occurs to me to do this not being sure whether the brick is going to go down or up. <laughs> when I drop a brick, I go like this because I know it's going down. That's what bricks do in that situation. And um, it is through a long history of foot pain that human beings have come to understand that. And in a world in which there was no pain or suffering, there would no, be no beings who are rational in the way that we are rational. It is a totally incoherent notion. It would be like living in a, a torqued version of Roadrunner land. Everybody has seen Roadrunner, right? You have probably noticed that the general laws of physics do not work in Roadrunner land. <laughs> Uh, sometimes you can run off the end of a mountain and sometimes you can't. Sometimes things fall down, sometimes they fall up. Uh, now, for, for the world I'm describing to be really accurate, we would even have to take away the consistency that is there in Roadrunner land. There is a certain predictability about it, and Wiley Coyote's inability to see that inconsistency is what makes him so stupid. But imagine it was totally inconsistent and it kind of worked in random ways for both Roadrunner and Coyote. We can't, even, we can't even conceptualize such a world. So yeah, I can imagine a world that has, doesn't have pain and suffering, but a world like that would have nothing in common with the world in which we live. Everybody still with me? Okay. Modal logic. It's fun, isn't it? Okay, so I, I want to imagine a, a variety of ways that uh, God could have made the world in relationship to him. Uh, uh, there, there is one imagination about that that we typically call something like deism. And that's the notion of a God who kind of made the world, wound it up, sent it on its way, and then decided to take a several million year nap. He has absolutely no interaction with the world. The world is just kind of, you know, it's like a top that, that God, you know, yanked on really hard. And it's going to spin, 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 spin until it stops spinning. And, and God has no relationship with the world other than that. And it's not impossible to see why people might come to such a conclusion. If they have a prayer record like mine. <laughs> And, and, you know, you can kind of think, okay, that's, that's one way we could imagine uh, the relationship. Another way we could imagine the relationship, and this one's touchier, is we could imagine the relationship to be something like magic. And it does seem to me that some Christians have bought into a concept of magic that has little to do with Christian faith. Uh, magic has to do with me by the use of certain words, certain phrases, certain rituals, certain practices to be able to control the environment of the world that's around me. Or maybe to control God. Uh, so, um, uh, just to make sure we sort of, sort of got this here, those of you who are like me who have a Church of Christ background, uh, we have had elements of magic in our tradition. If you say the right words and do things the right way, then this is what has to happen. And the failure to say those words in that way means that whatever it is we're trying to do doesn't take. 
Okay, that's magic. Uh, and and we, we sometimes conceptualize prayer as a form of magic. It is a way of manipulating or controlling God or the environment. Uh, I don't think that is a biblical way of thinking. I don't think the world is magical in that way. Um, I would actually think that the Bible was fairly consistent in its insistence that God cannot be controlled. Um, that you cannot manipulate God. That either by right action or right ritual, you can't, you can't force God's hand. Um, another way of, of modal logic of, of conceptualizing how God might relate to the world is that everything in the world that happens happens because of the direct will or design of God. Uh, and so things like free will are an illusion. It may feel like we're making free choices, but we're not. Uh, you are here because you were bound to be here. It felt like a free choice, but it wasn't. Uh, your buying of the videos will seem like a free choice, but <laughs> it's, it's really not. Um, and I, I sometimes sort of kid my students that uh, they tend to move into that point of view at points where it's convenient to them. Like when they're late to class. Um, you know, they didn't intend to be. It was, I don't know, they were providentially hindered. Um, <laughs> And, and, and so we have this world where, this picture where the world is basically this kind of, this kind of toy box of, of God. By the way, I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm not using the word Calvinism to describe this for a reason. Calvinism is actually far more sophisticated than what I'm uh, presenting. I'm, I'm presenting another, another kind of form of, of, of viewing the world. Uh, but in this, in this last form of viewing the world, uh, again, prayer is only by God's willing you to pray. And in your praying, nothing happens except whatever was designed to happen. And so what it actually is, is a kind of interesting play. Now, those are all ways of, of conceptualizing kind of what God's uh, relationship uh, to the world is. And I think they all miss... Uh, kind of what prayer uh, is about. Now, I want to, uh, I want to lay the James passage uh, down beside uh, one from Paul because they make such interesting conversation partners. Um, uh, Romans chapter 8, which is a, a passage that is eschatological, that is, it has to do with uh, the end. It's all shaped by God's view of what's coming up at the end. Um, and uh, he gets to verse 26, strange passage, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Okay, if you get too chummy with the Bible, uh, that is if you read it enough that you quit listening to it, uh, you may miss how kind of odd that whole paragraph is. We do not know what we ought to pray for. We do not know what we ought to pray for. There's at least a suggestion uh, in that passage um, I don't know that there are better and worse ways to pray. We do not know what we ought to pray for. 
Yeah, okay, so here's the Harris commentary on that. I do not know what I ought to pray for, so I'll just pray for everything and let God sort it out. <laughs> it's one way to think about it. And he says, okay, because uh, we do not know what we ought to pray for, well, let's stop for more commentary. Um, is there any sense in which that's true? Well, yeah. Uh, you've been in situations where you're ready to pray and you say to God, boy, I don't even know what I should be asking for here. Uh, especially when you're praying for other people, I don't even know what I need, much less what somebody else needs. Um, so I, okay, I, I, I get that to a point. Uh, and, and then it gets weirder. He says, oh, but never mind. The Spirit intercedes for us with groans. That, I don't know. Can't be uttered or something. Spirit language. The Spirit intercedes with spirit language. And God gets spirit language. And... Uh, and so responds. Now, it's interesting to me, those, those two passages seem to be in such different worlds. Uh, James says, hey, Elijah was just like us. You pray for it to rain, it rains. You pray for the sick, God heals them. And Paul comes along and says, mm, we don't always know what we ought to pray for. And so we need the Spirit to come along to kind of stand between us and God. And of course, you know, the, the basic Harris problem is how to say yes to both of those things. How do, how do we say yes to both? Um, and so I, I want to come back uh, to modal logic and give you a quick uh, Harris view of what the world is really like in all of its complexity. Um, God, uh, because he is relational, uh, by the way, he was relational before the first human being was created, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Human beings are kind of late to the party in terms of relationship. Uh, the importance of the doctrine of the Trinity is that it says God in His very nature is relational and all things lean into relationship. Um, we, we often use uh, words that ring theologically uh, shallow like fellowship as being a nice thing to come along. It's not a nice thing to come along. It is the basic truth of all reality. Reality is relational. So, because God is relational in His very nature, He wants more relationship, so He creates human beings. Who, um, he creates some other stuff too, but it, it's mostly because it's cool. <laughs> Giraffes are cool. Um, but he creates human beings with the unique capacity for relationship. Um, you know, we've probably had these conversations before. If you're, a, if you're an animal lover like I am, uh, you tend to over-exaggerate animals' ability towards relationship. Uh, they have some, but it's nothing like yours. Uh, they're very, they're very bad. Like at passing on knowledge from generation to generation. Yeah. Uh, that's why, despite the fact, you know, there's a great, interesting experiment about about uh, learning how human children learn and primates learn. And uh, early on, at certain tasks, the primates learn faster than the children do. But when you get to any task that involves relational knowledge, the human beings quickly go past uh, the apes. Um, and that's why, despite the fact there's very little difference in the DNA of an ape and human beings, human beings are using computers and the apes are swinging in the trees. 
Human beings have unique capacity for relationship. And, and then God does something sort of astounding. Uh, this is Genesis, by the way, if you're not recognizing this. The first part wasn't, that was, that was me. Uh, that was pre-Genesis. Uh, uh, um, in Genesis, God creates human beings and says they are to exercise dominion. They're going to name the animals. And I don't really appreciate uh, what's going on here unless I read some other early creation epics and compare them. Like Enuma Elish. It's a great creation epic. It's great reading if you like kind of ancient uh, poetry, which is not understandable. Um, but in the crucial lines in Enuma Elish, when uh, the gods are creating human beings, uh, the line says, they created human beings so that the gods could be relieved of their labor. That is, human beings were essentially created to be slaves of the gods. The picture in Enuma Elish is that the gods create human beings so that during the commercials they do not have to go get their own beer. <laughs> uh, that would be a kind of a hip translation of what's uh, there. Uh, the word commercial is not, is not in that text. Um, <laughs> Uh, but but there's, a, there's a very different view in Genesis. Uh, God creates human beings and then gives them, careful with the language here, almost God-like prerogatives in the world. It looks very much like a partnership. Unequal, to be sure. But it's as if God is inviting human beings to participate with him in the developing of a relationship in this good world. Um, now, if you remember Genesis, it turns out that human beings are a little over their head in this. Uh, that is, we sort of made a muck of it. Um, and God seems to have kind of been ready for that, too. Uh, but but where, where it goes wrong, um, if, you'll, if you'll remember from Genesis 3, uh, where it goes wrong is when human beings no longer want to be dependent upon God, but seek to become the source of their own security. The serpent says, this fruit will make you like God. And just as a passing thought, that is an excellent idea. Uh, unless you've seen the movie Bruce Almighty. <laughs> In which case you know it's a terrible idea. Because human beings make excellent human beings, but they make poor gods. Um, and, so, and so as they try to they begin to assert their independence, the whole world kind of comes apart. And, and, and then the Bible kind of has this story of God's uh, redemptive acts in, uh, in Jesus Christ. Okay, I think if we're, if we're going to understand prayer properly, we've got to understand it in the context of this story. Um, one of my favorite uh, uh, authors on prayer uh, puts it this way, uh, there are three primary ways in which you can cooperate with the work of God in the world. Those ways are thinking, working, and praying. And in some ways, the beginning of wisdom is to know what kind of problems are amenable to what kind of solution. When we try to solve problems by praying that are better solved by thinking or working, there's a problem. Uh, this happens when my students' primary preparation for their final test is to pray. <laughs> I'm not opposed to that idea, but the evidence suggests this doesn't work. 
Um, and part of it could be because I have a more prayer, powerful prayer life than they do, where I, I pray that God will give them answers, they'll just be wrong. Uh, um, but sometimes we try to solve by thinking and working things that are better addressed in prayer. Um, one of my one of my primary ways of of trying to be helpful to students in in these later years has been when they come in and we talk about whatever's bothering them i'll say okay let's sit together with this i'm going to set my my phone for five minutes, and I just want us to sit with God together. Um, because often I know that I have absolutely no way to help or fix what's troubling them. But we can pray. Um, and in this case, I think the most powerful way of praying is just sitting with it with God. Because there is a spirit that speaks with inhuman groans for us. And that's not a way of abdicating responsibility. It's a way of joining God in what he's trying to do in the world. It's being one of the partners in this. Um, prayer is, is one of the ways that uh, every time we do it, prayer, you probably didn't know you were doing this. Okay, you need to pay attention at this point. I notice I say that in my classes sometimes. I'll say to my students, okay, now you need to pay attention. And that implies that there was no need for them to up to that point. Uh, but... Okay, I've been saying a lot of drivel up till now, but this is really important. Uh, um, which, which they're quickly translating is, okay, this is going to be on the test. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I have no idea what I was talking about. Um, um, when, when we, when we uh, come to prayer, we are always confessing the mistake of Genesis 3. That's one of the th primary things prayer does. We don't often think about it, but what we're doing is when we come to prayer is we're saying to God that when the world is completely in the control of human beings, that turns out to be a mistake. And um, uh, prayer is the way that you say you're in over your head. One of those ways you say, okay, I want to I subscribe to the view of the world that says human beings were created out of God's deep relationality and he wants to do things with us. Um, um, One, one writer I, I particularly like has raised the question that if people judged, let, I think he uses the example of Martian sociologists. Um, if Martian sociologists came down and studied human beings and decided what we thought was important by listening to us pray, what would they think was the most important thing to us? Um... And boy, sometimes it's really hard for us to get past great Aunt Maud's cancer. Uh, and if you would listen to us pray, you would think that we believed in magic and that what we were primarily trying to do is get control of God and the world. Try to control the environment. Uh, which is very different to listening to people pray, like Paul, who says, God, I pray that their eyes may be opened and that they can come to know where prayer becomes a way of seeing. Um, 
where prayer becomes not so much a way of recruiting God to our program as being recruited to His. Uh, where it becomes a way of, of, of seeing what God is trying to do in the world and then try to find creative ways, thinking and working, to join Him in that work. Um, okay, so here, here's, the, the, here's the gratuitous lizard Godzilla uh, part. Uh, I can imagine a world that had a God and had a world in which prayer was utterly unimportant or not present. I can imagine that. Uh, but God decided to give us this incredible gift of saying, I want relationship and I want partnership and I want participation. I want us to do this together in the understanding that when you do it by yourself, you muck it up. And this good gift, and, 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 and my conviction that some, I, I really do believe that some things probably happened in the world because of prayer that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, uh, Glenn, uh, Glenn Henson, one of the great spiritual masters of the, of the 20th century, uh, some of you will have heard this before, but I need to get it on tape. Um, he, he says the best way to think about this is with the Dr. Seuss book, Horton Hears a Who. Uh, perhaps not the high point of Seuss's career, but um, it's not bad. And you know this story where you have all these little who's and they're getting ready to be destroyed because nobody knows they exist and they're all trying to make as much noise as they can, but the people can't hear them. And then, and then they find the littlest who in Whoville and he's not doing anything and so they get him to do something too and all he can do is go yip, but his yip combined with all the other noise that people are making is just enough where all the other animals can hear that Whoville exists and Whoville is saved. Hooray, Dr. Seuss. <laughs> And uh, Henson says, a prayer is that yip. Uh, because we work in such a short-sighted way. Uh, we look through the knothole of a fence and think we're seeing the world. And there's all these things going on in the world, and then there's this yip, which sometimes makes no difference at all and sometimes saves the world. And the deal is, you never know exactly when is going to be which, and so what you do is you yip. Or uh, in, in Jesus, uh, who, who, who wasn't quite as um, good as uh, Dr. Seuss with, with the language, uh, he just tells a story about praying all the time. Uh, because he says, if you pray all the time, there's a chance you will wear God out. I don't write him. <laughs> Jesus. Or in Paul's prosaic words, pray without ceasing. That is, we're a yipping bunch of people. Not because we're trying to control the environment or control the world, but because we want to join in what God's doing and we have no idea what all else He's doing. So, come on God, we're going to yip. Um, and um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you, uh, un unanswered prayer, I suppose, uh, is a problem. Uh, but I have a deep appreciation for the limited nature of human view. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't mind telling you that uh, I find it as problematic to say we prayed and I know God saved us from that tornado as I do to say God sent that tornado to hit those people. I find both of them equally problematic. It may be true, but you don't know that. There's no way you could. You know no such Thing. What you know is that there is a loving relational God who's leaning into you while you're leaning into Him. That's what you know. And prayer becomes one of those ways that we lean in. 
Um, uh, yeah, God doesn't, God, God doesn't give me everything uh, I pray for. Uh, but then again, um, let me uh, finish my time uh, with Jesus. Uh, the prayer life of Jesus is bookended uh, by what we call the Lord's Prayer and by the prayer of Gethsemane. There's quite a bit of praying in between. Uh, the Lord's Prayer, you all have memorized. We won't say it together because you've memorized it in different versions and it's awkward. <laughs> um, and depending on your age and condition, uh, there is a line that goes something like this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then you trot over here to the, to the Gethsemane prayer. And with his almost dying breath, Jesus says, not my will, but yours. Oh, it might be an accident. Might be. Uh, but I, I, I at least want to suggest, think out loud about, uh, we tend to think the single most important prayer, uh, I, uh, element of prayer is faith. Now, I'm a little doubtful about that. <laughs> I worked so hard on that. <laughs> There's just like 10 of you who appreciate that line. <laughs> I'm doubtful about faith. What is wrong with you? Are you tired? <laughs> it's really good. Um, yeah, I'm doubtful about that because uh, Jesus says that if you have a faith small as a grain of mustard seed, it can move a mountain. It doesn't take much faith to do anything. Uh, I'm more inclined to think that the single most important element in prayer is not faith, it's submission. Your will be done. And that's why I don't really know always how I ought to pray because I have such a short-sighted view of the world. I have no idea what serves the purposes of the kingdom of God. What I know is what I want. And this isn't magic. It's not a way of controlling or manipulating the world. It's a way of joining God in what He's doing. It is a way, in the words of some great writers, of thinking God's thoughts after Him. It's of seeing the world in a different way. Um, um, most of you know that um, in, in terms of my, my personal prayer life, I've almost entirely abandoned words because I find them far too blunt a instrument for what I want to do. I much prefer at this point to sit with God. Within the background, your will be done on earth. Um, I'd like to find ways to join you in what you're doing. And I would, um, I would like to loosen my grip on the need to control the world. The lizard that has grown into Godzilla is that prayer has too often become the way of gaining control over that which we have discovered we have no control over. Better to yield to the cross. Better to submit to God. Better to say, there is no security here. Better to let the anxiety go and know that the world is in good hands. Uh, better to quit trying to control the world and join the one who has control of the world and what he's trying to do in the world. Better for prayer to become a way of listening rather than a way of demanding. Better for prayer to be a way of thinking God's thoughts after him rather than trying to get him to think my thoughts. 
uh, because the world turns out to be in infinitely good and loving hands. Uh, we do need prayer renewal in our time, but we don't need people to pray more. What we need is to pray very differently. Um, because after all, when we're all just expressing our own wants and demands, we're just canceling each other out anyway. Um, Better to, better to let the Spirit groan and say, okay, God, whatever will bring in the good world that you desire, your preferred future, your will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore, world without end. Amen. <laughs>